So, let me just write this down. Search strategies and tools, right? So we often talk about methodology, which is related to strategy, and methods, which is related to tools. So your methodology is how, what is your strategy? How are you going to, to do your research? And, um, and to do that, you use a number of different tools, a number of different methods. And then we'll talk about this a little bit more at the end, but in general, you want to use a nice package of different methods to do your research. So you're not only reading books or you're not only experimenting, but you're doing, you know, you're doing reading books and articles and experimenting and interviews and, you know, score analysis, stuff like that. So um, when you put together a package of different approaches, then you make a really solid research. So, but, you know, it, it starts when your your research tools what you know what do you want to know what do i want to know um in what form is the knowledge Right, so you, you want to make your concert of uh, improvising in between the pieces, but w what are we talking about there? Are we talking about, do I need to learn to compose? Do I need to improvise? Do I need to, to learn how you present concerts? You know, what is it? And then in what form is the knowledge? Is it, is it in practice? Is it in recordings? Are there interviews? Are there books? You know, so that's just... Uh, um, a question we ask. And then the other question is, how can I extract it? How can I extract it? And that depends on the kind of knowledge, where it is, what form you need it. Depends on where, what form, how you need it. So literally, if it's a concert video of someone playing an hour and a half concert and improvising, or if it's the Coleman concert from Keith Jarrett, then, um, you know, that's what, hour and a half, then, uh, or something, then, uh, you, you, you know, you might want to take a certain moment and look at a certain moment to reduce it. How is it going to be useful? Because we can't, look at an entire book or like, like a whole book, right? So, you know, you want to look at some specific parts which are mostly relevant for you. Um, okay, so these are some of the, uh, the, the sort of starting points. Now, a another uh, idea which plays a big role are two types of information. which is quantitative which is like uh, numbers data, right? So 
for example, um, I interviewed amateur singers, and I in interviewed 20 amateur singers, and, uh, or no, I, I interviewed 50 people, um, and uh, I asked them if uh, singing in an amateur choir makes you happy, yes or no. And 37 people said yes, right? So 37 out of 50 people say singing in amateur choirs is, makes you happy, right? Or, you know, so this is a type of quantitative data. And it could be that in all of your researches that there is some role for this kind of information, numbers. But in general, in artistic research, we spend a lot of time talking about qualitative information. Qualitative info. Which is not, which is, uh, uh, you can call it data, which is observed. <clears throat> not measured. And then we're thinking about descriptions opinions even stories. Right, so this is when you talk about, um, uh, well, this theme was used uh, and then uh, uh, it was developed in a number of different ways, right? You're describing processes or you say, well, the, uh, the tone color was a very bright tone color, right? So how do we measure that? I mean, maybe it's possible, but in general, you know, we, we, are, we are using descriptive words to talk about information. And mostly the artistic research spends a lot of time using this kind of information, um, the descriptive information. Okay, so here's a, I'm gonna give you a brief overview. Okay, well you guys have this, so I'm gonna erase this already, and then, uh, uh, and then I'm gonna give you an overview of the tools, and then we're gonna talk about them one by one. Okay, so number one, literature, right? which we sometimes call desk research. Books, articles, audiovisual stuff, right? Videos, CDs, YouTube, websites, right? And then number two, survey. So like asking how many people are happy from singing in amateur choirs. And then a little bit related to that. So like a survey is like broad, right? And then you come up with, uh, uh, you. Often surveys are best for quantitative data. And then for 
the, the, the individual version of that is interview. Let's say individual. Uh, then we have case study. How does Keith Jarrett improvise in a concert? Let's, let's look at the way he does it, or did it. And then we have ethnography. Which is, uh, you know, studying a culture. And we often think of it in terms of, uh, you know, some foreign culture, like we go to Africa, and like if we're gonna study um, uh, uh, the ritual of you know, drumming in communities in Senegal, we're gonna go to Senegal and we're gonna live there for a month and we're gonna drum in the community and see what kind of role that takes, right? That's, that's your obvious example of ethnography, but it may also be like, there's a culture among improvising pianists, and that has its own uh, contexts. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then uh, the last method, which is very big, is the experiment. And this is where you generate your own data. So, and there are many different forms of experimentation, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay, so let's just go through each of these a little bit more deeply. Um, uh, but just to give you an, an idea, so these are like your different tools, and then you would make a sort of package of these that may, that will uh, comprise of your data collection, right? So, in you're doing your research part uh, of the research, then you're gonna collect a bunch of information and these are the different tools you use, right? Um, we haven't talked, uh, just before I go, and now I'm stepping backwards, but before we um, go into each of them, did we talk about the research cycle? Have you guys heard about that? It, or it's in the book? So research cycle, right? So the, you make your reference recording, you reflect upon it, and you get some feedback. And on the basis of that, you devise a data collection. And the data collection uses these tools. And then after the data collection, you do your intervention, which is where you all the information that you've learned and experimented with, you then apply it to your practice and then you make a new reference recording. So that's, that's your basic inter, uh, research cycle, which and at the end of that, you've, you've uh, achieved something and then that leads to the next step. And sometimes that's uh, in a straight line and sometimes it turns left or right. So, um, and we will talk more about that, I think next lesson. Uh, the research cycle, but uh, but that's it in an overview, and so you just keep coming back to that because this first proposal is about exactly what you're going to do for this research cycle, and then the next semester is you're going to do your first research cycle, right? So that's that's the way it's structured here. So we spend the first semester making a proposal, researching, doing your literature review, deciding on your topic, making your plan, which is your proposal. And then in the second semester, you carry out the plan. So the, the exams in December are feedback on your plan. And then the exams in May next year are actual uh, seeing if you did it correctly. So, um, but in general, we are staying in touch the whole time. So this should, as long as you're working on it and staying in touch, it should all go fine. Uh, okay, so let's look at these, uh, let's look at these uh, tools. So literature research, 
right? Books, articles, recordings, um, websites, right? I already said that, but also, for example, scores, manuscripts, pictures, letters, right? Whatever. Journals. So we call it literature, um, but it's all kinds of information, right? So uh, whatever media form. Um, and the way this works with the literature research is, okay, so you collect these things, and then you say what's in there. Oh, I, I collected this book on uh, chorale improvisation, and it's really short. <laughs> but what you do with each one of them is you summarize and analyze. So again, this is your objective and subjective approaches. So all the things that you read, and this is going to be in your data collection. You're going to say, oh, I found this book. But it's not like, a, it's not like you're just going to list it there. You're going, to, you're going to say what's in it. You're going to take a quote from it. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, uh, and, then, uh, um, and then you're going to say what you think, right? So you're going to use it. You say, well, I developed this theatrical technique and uh, uh, based on the way actors uh, create interpretation and I've applied, you know, I think that's really interesting because in a way I could use that in combination with the, with the story of this piece to create a new type of um, uh, performance of this piece, right? So then you really relate it to your research. Um, and the thing, one of the things that happens with the literature research is like, you, you get a book, you say, oh, it's really short, but then you go into the back and there's a bibliography and he lists five other books. So very quickly, you get this snowball effect. One thing leads to other things. And so really quickly, you will get too much information actually, too many sources. And this is like a thing for all of you to learn to deal with. Okay, what, now I need like 10 years to read all these books and watch all these videos. And, um, and so that's, that's a really good problem to have. First of all, because it gives you a broad, so that you know, you try to get a broad overview of what's out there. And then it forces you to make choices. Say, well, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna do German choral improvisation. I'm gonna do North German uh, uh, improvis choral improvisation, right? So you start to, like we just went through, this literature review, it helps you orient where you are researching, what you can do, what you wanna do. It helps you get to the, the core of what, what it is that you want to do. And, and, and position that in the world. So um, in terms of the, the, the literature resources, usually the texts, we have two different types. We have the primary sources. Right, so uh, looking at Quance's book on the flute, right? On how to play the flute. Quance says that this is the way they did the ornamentation back then. And, and you can, you read his words about it. That's your primary source. And then we have the secondary sources. Secondary sources. And that's where Jed Wentz in his article talks about Quance's book. And then Jed says, oh yeah, uh, uh, Quance 
uh, used the typical type of Baroque or, uh, ornamentation in his music, but there were other types which Quantz didn't use, whatever, you know? So there he's talking about Quantz. So now we are reading a source by Jed Wentz about Quantz. And so that's your secondary source. Just like, you know, we talk about your text scores, right? The original score. So it's a little bit like, okay, let's go back to the original and then see how we relate to that. And um, that's, that's often a good approach with anything that's really important for your research, is uh, create your own impression. Don't just use secondary sources, because maybe you have a different opinion. So we're going to talk more about how to implement this in a little bit. But first, first I want to go on to some of the other tools. So let's go on to survey. Right? So survey is broad, gives you an overall picture of something. The relationship between happiness and amateur choirs, which I think three of you are re researching, right? Um, you can generate a large amount of data through surveys, right? So uh, if you ask a bunch of questions, you get a bunch of answers. And if you have 30 different forms that people have filled out, then, you know, you've got a lot of, uh, a lot of information to deal with, right? So it could be that you, you develop your concerts, and then you want to give a little... The audience to... Yeah, say, what did you think? Did you think it was an improvisation or a composition? Was it helpful? What did it, you know, whatever. Or maybe one of the vocalists wants to talk about presentation in a concert, and then they want to ask the audience, well, was that helpful or not? Um, the trick with surveys is to narrow it to... Uh, useful information, right? If you say, what did you think? Then you're gonna get 30 different paragraphs of information, and then they're all gonna be either slightly different or really different, and then you have a bunch of grays to work with. Whereas if you say, you know, uh, um, uh, did it work, yes or no, then people are going to say yes or no, right? So you, you, there's a strategy to the surveys which can be helpful. I, uh, I ran an online course this last year, and uh, at the end of it, I made a survey for all the participants, and, and I did it in Google Forms. I don't know if you've seen that. In fact, I was thinking at some, at some point I do that. You know, it was, uh, get a QR code on the Google form and just the people scan it yeah. on their mobile phones in one minute. Yeah. The Philippine, and then in my, I have my computer on the result. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it actually, it's really easy. Google Forms, and then you can design the way the survey works. So what I did, uh, I did a question. Uh, no, I did a combination of, uh, I don't know, um, if you're going to take a, a, a follow-up course, would you like to do it in October or November, right? And then they can click on one or the other. And then I, then I would say, I, I always did a question like that, which was quantitative, and then I added an, an a, a option for comments. And then some people would just answer one or the other, and some people say, well, actually, December works the best for me, or I prefer it in the summer. And so then it was a combination of specific information and then some general room for other options, right? It's like, how can I best take advantage of what people have to say? But I don't want to be dealing with 30 different opinions, right? So it's... It's, uh, there's an art to it. Okay. So, the, the, then, this is 
this in the way. The, the other way to get information from someone else is then the interview, right? So this is someone's insights. and experiences. So in your concert where you're improvising in between pieces, maybe you ask a couple general questions of the whole thing and then your teacher is there and then you sit down with him and you say, well, what did you think about this piece? And what did you think about the way I was developing that material? Or, you know, and then you can, you can interview and really go deep to one person's feedback. Um, okay, there are three types of interviews. Number one is the structured. A structured interview and a structured interview is where you uh, you go in and you have a list of six questions or five questions or three and they are exactly that and you ask those questions and you get the answer right so it's something you prepare anyway your, your interviews are usually prepared almost always prepared ahead of time and then um, uh, the structured interview is is rigid in form so but it could be useful if you want to ask three different people the same questions and then be able to compare and contrast them. And then the second one is the semi-structured. Structured. Right, and, and the structure is a little bit like a survey, right? So it could be also something you do on the email, the structured interview, but you know, the interviews are usually done live. The semi-structured is where you would ask a question, uh, you prepare your questions, but then you would leave space for follow-up questions within each of those, like sub-questions. So there's a, like a little bit of flexibility. So I, I've got these main questions I wanna ask, but you want to be able to go deeper. And probably for most of you, this is going to be the way that you will conduct your interviews. You want to, you want to, have, you want to prepare your questions ahead of time. You want to know what you want to know, but you want to be able to have flexibility to, to, to go deep into them. And then of course the last one is the open interview. Um, and that's, a, that's an interview where you don't have prepared questions, but you, um, uh, you just start talking about a topic and see where it leads. You know, I, with maybe with some, like for example, if you had a chance to interview Keith Jarrett, maybe you don't want to waste his time with your questions, but you just want to get him talking, right? Right, or sometimes, you, or if you have a, if you talk to Yo-Yo Ma, well, just get him talking about whatever he's, you know, I want to talk to you about improvisation and then see what he says, because he might say something that you totally did not expect, and you want to have that, that's way more interesting than your question about, do you think I should improvise in F or F sharp, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> just think of some question. So that, that's, that's the kind of situation where I think a more open, uh, interview could be interesting or if you think about like you guys sitting going out and having a beer and talking about improvisation the My difference insights, yeah. yeah the difference between piano and organ improvisation you know that's that's that would be you, you could kind of see that kind of hang out as a sort of open interview of each other because you would get some interesting information insights from each other So, um, so the way to do these interviews is to plan it, 
So they write this down. Number one, planet and eat. And then number two, make the appointment. Um, and then three, at the interview, usually you have an introduction. And then you say, I would like to, I'm interviewing you for my artistic research, and my topic is this. Do you mind if I record this interview? Um, eventually, I may also publish some of your comments. Thank you very much. It's really going to be helpful for me, and I would love to maybe put them in my, you know, whatever. So you, the person you're interviewing should also know what this is for. Um, and then... Uh, when you are publishing their comments, um, you might want to think about, do I need to uh, get permission, a second time of permission to publish them? For, and this is the example I always give of a student who, uh, he sent me a recording. This is one of my students a couple of years ago. He sent me a recording and said, hey, can you give me some feedback? And so I, I got out my phone and I said, oh, hey, yeah, this is a, 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 it's really nice to hear you play and totally cool the way you're playing that piece. And um, well, let's see, I think that uh, the first version was maybe better than the second version because, I don't know, you seem more relaxed and stuff. And so in the report, after it had been turned in, like right on the deadline, there was a, a transcription of my recording and it had it had all the words like well you know i don't know i kind of think that it was like it was a literal translation and like the uh and hey how's it going i don't know whatever i said it was all in there and i was thinking no but that is not what i would have wanted to have printed in his report he should have asked me is this okay or he should have cut that out or made a paraphrase of it. In fact, I was already asked to, to, to eliminate a comment from, I did a, a couple of interviews yesterday, and one of the people I interviewed told me, I will tell you this, but please, don't cut it, it. and don't put it anywhere. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, I mean, I right. so you have to play unidentified source or something, or just don't put it, yeah. Exactly, so there is a little bit, uh, there is a little bit of respect for the interviewee, which goes in there. And then that, that idea can also lead to ethical questions, right? Let's say, for example, um, I don't know, you interview me about the improvisation uh, of Louis Andreessen, right? The famous Dutch composer who just passed away. And, uh, and, and I start to talk about my experiences with him, and uh, and then I say something personal about going to his house and I don't know meeting some family. I don't know. I'm making this up, but let's say I I reveal to you some private information, which is not really public. That then you could run into some sort of ethical questions. It's like, oh, is this something that I should then make public, right? Or let's say, for example, coming out, like a gender issue, you know, that's also something that you don't want to be the one who then, you know, exposes a pers private personal information for somebody, right? So this is, the, these kinds of informations may come up in your interview. And if you have a question about any of that, for, by all means, come to me and, uh, uh, and we can talk about it. And... Um, uh, and if it's uh, there, you know, we're not talking, I'm not do, you know, doing a lecture on ethics now, but it could happen that you get into uh, an area where there is a question about ethics. And then, uh, and then we have a mechanism to deal with that. We can, we can let's say you say, well, I, I need to talk about this information because it's very important for my research. And then we can, there's a review board who can then take a look at this. So just to, to tell you that that's there, should you run into this area. But uh, um, in general, that's not 
usually a, a, a big thing with um, artistic research. OK, so those are your interview uh, uh, ideas. Let's move on. Case study. Okay, so your case study, it's, um, well, on one hand, it's exactly what we think of it is. Like, well, there's, it's, you know, you're studying one case. How does someone do something? So let's look at, you know, the way Keith Jarrett puts together a whole uh, um, concert of improvisations. And then we compare that with uh, a concert of improvisations by Albert von Feinendahl. Um, so, in, so the case study is where you are going in depth, right? In depth into one example. And it's a lot of qualitative information. Well, Keith Jarrett, he tends to use repetition a lot and um, take a motive and then repeat that and then do different harmonies underneath it, whatever, you know? So then we're talking about what are the, what are the, the qualities of, of his work in this case? Um, so you're looking for specific meanings and understanding. And in your case study, you may be interviewing, right? Uh, uh, observation, right? What are your own observations? Observations and literature research. Right, so in your case study, right, because we're studying one particular case, we're going to use some of these other tools, interview, observation, literature research, to find out what, so, you know, we, we would look at Keith Jarrett's videos, we would look at the recordings, we would look at the interviews, probably there's some books written about his improvisation, other PhD theses, that kind of stuff. And so then you use a technique which is really important, called triangulation. Triangulieren in het Nederlands. Doesn't exist so much in Holland as a, as a concept. Localiseren, maybe. Yeah, yeah, triangulation, right? But the the there isn't a good translation of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we know what triangulation is, right? When you when you have, and the reason they call it triangles because if you have three po if you're trying to find the position of one point with three other points, you can always figure that out, right? So like when they're looking for to know where your cell phone is, they have three different cell tone cell phone towers and then they know where your phone is. But in artistic research, we will also do that. We will triangulate a topic, 
by, and, and this comes down to the putting together all these different methods, is you're triangulating your, your research area by choosing it from different perspectives, and not just three, but maybe four or five or 20. And so that's how you, you become, uh, becomes clearer. Okay, so that's your case study. Um, that's probably relevant for all of you. So you probably all use case study. Um, now, ethnography. Right, we just talked about that field work. Going into the middle of your area of study, participating, observing, extended <laughs> interviews, documenting, right? So you are, you are uh, really experiencing it. So being in the middle of, of the culture which you are studying. So the idea of ethnography being culture, you know, we talk about, right, ethnic, you know, ethnic identity, where do you come from? Which kingdom in Spain are you from? You know, that's a, those are, they're all really different, right? And um, uh, sometimes we talk about autoethnography in terms of research. And autoethnography would be then your own personal culture, right? You have your own culture. You have your own rituals, your own ways of doing things. And, um, uh, and so sometimes that's also said for as a sort of research technique um, in artistic research, but we don't talk about that because it is basically uh, a given, right? When we're talking about artistic research, we're talking about your practice and you reflecting on your practice and you changing it, growing it, and, and uh, explaining how it is. Well, I think it's like this. I think it can go like this. And based on my motivation and my history, I, I come from somewhere, right? So autoethnography is a part of all of your researches. So we don't even include it here because it's like, it's, uh, it's already there. Okay. <coughs> Okay, you guys have all this? Then I'm gonna go to experiment. Uh, and I'm gonna erase it all. Okay, so Excuse me. So, like I said, experiment is where you're generating your own data. Um, and, you know, we, we might know experimentation from scientific research, right? The experimental method. Right, where you have a hypothesis and then you test that hypothesis and you have a group that you're testing and then you have a control group which you're not testing, right? And so then you, and then you come up with a really logical, rigid uh, uh, testing process. So scientific uh, experimentation. So that's not what we're doing here, right? That's, that's for scientific research. Um, but, what we are doing is what you could call quasi-experimentation. Where you are experimenting with things, but you're not doing it in a rigid fashion. You're also using your own tools of uh, insight to help guide you. Um, and it's, it's 
uh, it's less time consuming and it's much more faster to get to the relevant information for your artistic research. Um, so, you know, one, one group, we can call a group, but maybe it's yourself. You're just experimenting yourself. Um, so you're not getting like facts, the data of scientific research, but you're getting valuable ideas ideas or info that can be worked out or tested. So the quasi-experimentation, that is kind of what you are doing when you are trying things out. So you, you, you're, it's a combination of logic, what, what, are, what are some of the possibilities, <clears throat> and it's a combination of your emotions. What do you think, what is your body telling you is right or wrong, right? So this is the way we mostly operate in the world. We are, t <clears throat> we are testing what we think of anything. Even if you go to the store and you wanna buy some cereal and there are four different types you think about, well, what's important to you, like eating lots of sugar or eating healthy, right? You have these, you have these guiding principles which help you make choices. And um, uh, there's also like, the, uh, uh, it turns out that we cannot take a logical decision without the use of our emotions. And they, there, there was a, what happens, there was a, a woman who was like a, a manager and like a leader in what she was doing and she was uh, involved in a motorcycle accident and then it, 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 it uh, hurt the part of her brain where she, which kind of was somehow was related to emotional decisions. And then indeed, she would go to the store and try to buy some pasta and she would see 10 different types of pasta and she just couldn't choose. She's like, ah, it's too many, I don't know what to do. Even though it was a, in general, a really logical person. So what, what they learned from that is even our logical decisions are informed by our emotions, right? So this is, um, this is the way it works. Even if we are thinking we are being really logical, it's, it's still being informed by our emotions. So this is where the quasi-experimentation uh, uh, sits in this world where we are experimenting things, but we are also being uh, guided by our taste, our impressions, our body, right? So like when I, when I listen to a piece of music and I give feedback on it, I, I, uh, even if it's my own music which I'm writing, I'm listening to how my body responds to it. Do I like it? Do I not like it? Do I feel good? Do I feel bad? You know, all these things. And so that's a sort of uh, 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 experiment, which I'm doing. So, but, but the quasi-experimentation, this could also be broader. Like say, for example, you're uh, researching, you know, cueing in your ensemble with percussion. And then you look at the different you know, between the two of you, you are discussing how that works and how you're gonna experiment, right? Or in a string quartet, maybe you wanna practice cueing between all the members and see how that works in terms of uh, the, the, the accuracy of the coming in together and the quality of the music which you start, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so the quasi-experiment could be one group but then next to that, we also have self-experiment, right? Which is not in a group, it's just yourself. So I'm, uh, I'm experimenting with different ways to use these chorale melodies. And first I try by putting it in the bass, and then I try by putting it in the middle, and then, you know, whatever. So the, these are the kinds of 
experimentations which you would do in your, or I'm going to take, you know, I have three different materials from the first piece and four different materials in the second piece, and then I'm going to try some combinations to improvise those materials together, right? I take the first one and the second one. Or let's say in that example, you would then be trying to put the materials together. Maar, but the next way of experimentation is called the parametric experimentation. So let's say, indeed, you, you're trying to improvise the transition between two pieces. And the first piece has three different materials, and the second piece has four different materials. So a parametric experiment is where you would methodically test out all the combinations. So if I have A, B, C, and one, two, three, four, I would say, okay, I'm gonna take A, with one, A with two, A with three, A with four, and then I'm gonna take B with one, B with two, B, you know? And so then you would have, in this, you would have 12 different options to try out. So that would be a parametric experiment. That's a systematic uh, exploration of all the different permutations of uh, a limited number of exact variables. And maybe that's interesting for some of you. Um, right? So like, uh, and I think with the, you guys who are improvising, that could also be interesting to, to do it that way instead of like, oh, I improvised and then I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this, right? And then to say, because I did it, it was good, right? That would be the sort of uh, assumption. But who knows, if you, if you go a different way in a different way, you might come up with something better, right? So the parametric experiment, it's um, this idea of looking at your possibilities and then researching all of them can help you discover a lot of things that you might not have discovered intuitively. That's the point. But if, you know, uh, the, the only problem with the parametric experiment is that it can get too many. Like if you have uh, uh, th three elements plus four elements plus another three elements, yeah. then all of a sudden, yeah, it explodes once you add another variable. So that's uh, that's a risk. So you you know you have to think uh, strategically on how to use this in a, in an effective way. Okay, and then our last type of experiment is the reenactment. Reenactment. So, in this version, I'm going to play Sardinks the way uh, my teacher played it in her concert when she was a student, where she had on a certain costume or whatever. I mean, maybe that's not a great example, but, um, uh, or like historically informed practice, right? I'm gonna get a cello and I'm gonna get a Baroque bow, bow and I'm gonna put on gut strings and I'm gonna play this uh, Baroque sonata and I'm gonna see um, how that works. What does it tell me about the music? Or for example, or I'm gonna play a Beethoven's sonata on a forte piano. I'm gonna play it on the instrument that he wrote it for, and I'm gonna see what I learned about the music, right? Which is, of course, a revolution into Beethoven to play his music on the music he wrote for. So um, the reenactment is where you are making a new version of an old event, and it leads to embodied knowledge. And you use this in combination with 
reflexive writing. So you, you've, uh, you've played Beethoven on the forte piano. It feels really different on your fingers and it sounds different. And then you write about those experiences. So, or you, you do one of Claire Chase's pieces and you play it the way she performed it with her gestures. And then you see, oh, that made me uh, uh, really bring out this type of gesture. It also changed the way I articulated the piece, you know? Uh, so you're, you're reflecting on your experience, right? Reflexive writing is talking about yourself in your own experience. It's different than reflective writing, right? I can reflect upon this marker, but that's not me. That's just me reflecting on something outside of me. So, um, so the reenactment, this could be interesting, or maybe you want to get the, the music to the Köln concert from Keith Jarrett, and you just want to read it. I have it in the reference list. Right. The so then you, let's, let's say you just, you know, you turn up the temperature in your room, and you pretend it's that hot summer day, and then you, you, know, you get a couple friends, and then you read through it, and see if you can create the same spontaneity uh, or see what happens. See, yeah, see what it feels. Yeah, see what it feels to read it through. And, in, in, you know, all kinds of uh, really interesting observations would come out of that. Um, whether they're useful for your research, I'm not sure, but uh, that's a different question. Um, but for some of these researches, uh, the reenactment could be really useful. Okay, so those are the tools. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how to deal with them. What time is it? Okay, I'm doing okay. So, in your using these tools for your data collection. Um, must be analyzed. To use it, right? So you've you've gotten some information, either in your survey, or in your experimentation, or in your interview, and then you need to say, well, uh, uh, my teacher thinks that you should only play something three times really slowly a day, and then, uh, um, and then that's all you need to practice, right? And, uh, and then you say, well, this is, a, this is a method to learn pieces uh, slowly and, and a, in a good way. So I, what I've done is I've analyzed it. So I've, I've said, well, what is this information? And then you could say, I'm going to try that out with uh, this new concerto I'm learning. Because I don't have to, I don't have to play it next week in my lesson. But I have a month before I need to play it, so I'm going to try this method. <clears throat> so, all the information you get, you analyze it. Now, what often happens is qualitative. And quantitative info is translated. Right? So if I have uh, what, I, what you do is you take quantitative data and you translate it into qualitative data. For example, uh, 37 out of 50 people, uh, uh, amateur singers, are happy with their amateur choirs. So what I've learned from that is that uh, amateur choirs uh, are, are uh, really good for our happiness, and I've decided to create my own amateur choir. So maybe that's not a great example, but you're turning 
uh, numbers, or let's say, um, you know, I interviewed four people about practicing slowly, and three of them say it's a really good method. So practicing slowly is a really, is a good method, right? So you're, you're creating a, a sort of analysis, a rule, a quality out of this, um, uh, this numbers. So you're translating that. Now, um, that's the quality. Which way did I go? I can't remember. Um, let's see here. You know, so like, you're asking, what do the numbers tell us? Maybe that was already the, the answer which I gave. So the numbers are telling us conclusions, which are, uh, which are not numbers. And then if you're going to take qualitative and then turn it into quantitative, you could say, well, you know, I, I was talking to um, uh, a bunch of people about practice methods, and all of them said that practicing slowly is uh, a really good idea. So then you've, you, you were talking to people about methods, and then you've come up with a number. 100% of the people I talked to said practicing slowly is good. So that, that's a quality thing which has been turned into quantity. So again, this is a reflection on your data. So when you're doing your data collection in your research cycles, you're not just putting it there, you're also talking about it, you're reflecting upon it, you're analyzing it, you're giving your opinion. That's going to be like, you know, there's going to be this A-B thing between the data and your thoughts upon it, how it's useful for you, how it's relevant, what you did with it. That is going to be uh, the sort of double-sided for all the information which is going into your report. Okay. So, and then the last point I want to want to make um, is that idea of triangulation, which we already talked about. Triangulation. Which is where you're going to do a. Uh, uh, a package of different research tools in your uh, in your res artistic research. So you're going to do the literature research, the interview, the experimentation. Um, maybe you do a survey. You know, maybe you do just several different types of experimentation. But all those things together are make for solid research. So when you are planning your research tools for your proposal, which you will turn in in some weeks, um, uh, think about what, the, what is the package of tools that, are gonna, that would help you make the best uh, research. Um, and you guys are deciding how this goes, right? We have a method here, but you guys fill in the detail. You decide what is relevant for you, what is interesting, what do you want to do, what is practical, what is related to what, how you want to do your artistic research. We're not going to tell you that. I may give you some tips, I may discuss with you, I may ask you to dig further into certain sources or, or to develop a, a, a relationship to it or something, but um, uh, but you guys are the designers of your research. That's a sort of important concept which you have to keep in mind. Uh, I'm not your teacher. I'm just accompanying you on your artistic research. That's the, that's the way it is. You guys are you're, you're the ones uh, standing on the surfboard, pushing it forward. And I'm just on the sideline, you know, giving you some tips. But you're the ones riding the wave, right? So, and that's the way it should be, right? This is why artistic research is so awesome. It's because it's about your own artistry, your own ideas, the way you want to grow yourself as a musician 
into an artist. And so um, uh, we give you this system here with the research cycles uh, because we think that this really works and it gives it a good structure, but still allows a lot of freedom. Um, so we are exploring this uh, and teaching it and talking about all these tools in these weeks and then you're going to do it and then when you graduate in a year and a half you'll you know you'll go on into life and then you will have all of this and then you know how that works and then you'll teach it to other people or you'll do it and you'll uh, You'll, maybe some of you will go on to do a PhD and then, you know, it'll be a variation of these tools. So, um, so it's good to know how this all works, research. Okay, any questions or comments or anything about all this? I kind of talked at you a lot, but uh, 